The story of our Savior began long before that iconic silent night, and the lineage of our Lord runs deep. Disguised in the downcast and dejected, and through shadowed sorrow and suffering it starkly stands. Though at times hushed and hidden, the holy remain ushered in, never turning back when others turn their backs, ever and always keeping its kin. The blessed and beautiful, passed over and protected, tying up the promise and wrapping up the gift to be given. Again and again and again, the very face of grace at Christmas. Welcome, everybody, and let me wish all of you a very Merry Christmas Eve. Thank you for joining me as we take a little bit of time to meditate on what does Christmas Eve really mean for you and for me. And I've got a promise I want to make to you. And the promise is if you listen carefully and believe what the scriptures say, I'm going to share a story with you, not just out of the scriptures, but a modern day story that I really believe is gonna bring Christmas home to your heart unlike it's ever done before. And I think you're gonna be greatly blessed because of that. But before I jump into this little story that I love, I wanna share with you from the scriptures in Matthew's account of the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm gonna be reading out of Matthew chapter one, beginning at verse 18. And there it says, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet, Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born and Joseph named him Jesus. You know, babies have a way of changing your life radically. I mean, ask any parent and especially ask a mother. I mean, your whole life is, is turned upside down. From the moment of conception, a mother's body literally physiologically begins to change, to make room and uh, to support this life that will now grow within the womb of the mother. I mean, this is a, a sense in which that mother is continually saving that child's life. Nine months later, after her body has changed a lot, she gives birth to that child. And you know something? For the next several months, that child depends on his or her parents, and particularly the mom, to feed, to nourish, to love, to change, to burp, <laughs> and all the things that go with having children. That mom continues, in a sense, to, to save that, that child's life. But let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard a story about a child who actually saves the mother's life? Have you ever heard a story about how important it was that this child in the womb of that mother was there because the mother would die without that child's presence. 
But one of my favorite stories at Christmas, which was printed in Moody Monthly years ago, describes such a situation. And I, I just love this story. And you may have heard it before. I actually taught it here at Wooddale, or I should say shared it here at Wooddale about nine years ago, I think it is. But I return to it frequently, and I want to share it again with you, because whether you've ever heard it before or you're hearing it for the first time, it is, to me, one of the most powerful windows into understanding what Jesus did when he came. So just as I read to you the true story of our Lord's conception by the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary and his birth, I want to share this true story with you. It comes from Nova Scotia. It was a story related by a young medical doctor back in the 1940s, an experience that he had. And he begins his telling by letting us know that when he met this particular woman, her name, and he calls her Eleanor to protect her privacy back then, Eleanor was probably once, he said, a beautiful red-headed woman and about 23 years of age when he met her. But he said the beauty was gone. Most of her red hair was gone, and she looked emaciated. She looked so toxic and so pale. It was just going to be a matter of days before she died. And he stood in her hospital room, and he said to her, Eleanor, we have done everything we can to try to save your life. But I need to let you know it is now in the hands of the Creator. There is just nothing more that we can do for you. And he said that she received the words with quiet dignity and then asked a favor. She said, if by chance I'm still alive on Christmas Eve, would you let me go home just for Christmas Eve? As a medical professional, he knew that that would be really risky. And part of him wanted to say, I can't do that. But then another part of him was convinced that she would be actually dead by Christmas Eve. So he made his promise. He said, yes, I'll. I'll, if you're still alive, I'll, I'll let you go home. See, what happened to Eleanor is that when her husband, as a soldier, came home from World War II, he had a mild case of tuberculosis. And before they could catch it, obviously he had been with his wife, and she caught it, and it settled in a very strange place. It settled in the lower lobe of her right lung, an unusual place and very, very difficult to treat. And it just took over her body. The doctors then tried everything they knew to help her out, all kinds of procedures. Some they knew they couldn't do, others they experimented with. For instance, they tried to push some air in between her right lung and her chest wall, but they couldn't do it. She'd had so many cases of pleurisy that literally her lung was stuck to the wall chest. They even talked about a radical new procedure in those days, that is taking out the lung itself but they knew that she'd never be able to survive the surgery. And that's why they, they shipped her home to spend the rest of her life in a TB annex to the local hospital. Now, let me read to you that initial meeting with Eleanor. Here's what the doctor says, and I quote, I still find it hard to believe. There I stood in front of her, and she had survived this long. He said, I had graduated from a university medical school in 1942, and I was only 31. I joined the Royal Canadian Air Force and then completed my training as an anesthesiast in Montreal once the war was over. A native of Sydney, Nova Scotia, I accepted a position with St. Martha's Hospital in Antagonish. I was to provide an anesthesia service, and take care of the medical needs of the students at two local colleges. I was also asked to look after a small TB annex to the hospital, a place for about 40 patients. Most of them were going to die. At one time, he said, Eleanor probably weighed about 123 pounds. Now, he said, as he stood in her room and met her, she was down to 83 pounds and would soon die. But he said there was something unusual about Eleanor. He said, whenever you did something for her, she would always smile and receive it with such kindness. And I guess he said that's what made him want to go the extra mile to find some way, perhaps, to spare her life. 
he had heard about a new drug called streptomycin that was being used to treat patients with these kinds of infections. He contacted Dr. Rabinowitz in Montreal and found out that the drug was not available yet for use. And after describing Eleanor's condition, the doctor said it probably wouldn't do any good anyway. He then contacted a surgeon in New York City who is experimenting with a new procedure where they would literally pump air into the peritoneal cavity in order to push the diaphragm up to then try to close that tubercular cavity. Hers was about an inch in diameter and expanding in the lower lobe. And so he learned what it was involved with it, how to do it, and he and some other doctors decided, you know, they had nothing, nothing to lose. So they tried the procedure, but it was so excruciating and painful for Eleanor, she couldn't stand it. And that's when, as I said earlier, he looked at her and said, there's nothing more we can do. Well, time went on. Somehow she kept hanging on and Christmas Eve showed up. And she reminded the doctor of his promise. He said to her, okay, I'll keep my promise to you. But he says, you have to wear a mask when you go home. And we're all familiar with masks, aren't we? He said, you have open TB, which means you're very contagious. And we don't want you coughing around family. And he said to her, I know you have a child already at home. You can't hold the child. You can't kiss the child. You got to keep that mask on. The only person you can be unmasked with is your husband because he's immune. He's already had it. So the ambulance came, they loaded her up, and they took her away. On Christmas Day, she returned, and she was weaker than she had been before she left. You could tell that the trip and the experience had been absolutely exhausting for her. The doctor was sure she didn't have too many days left. And then all of a sudden, she had a complication. She began to vomit every time she would eat. And the doctor couldn't figure out what was causing this to happen. So he brought in a colleague to consult and to see what might be causing this, this, this retching every time she would eat. And the doctor checked her over and couldn't find any, any reason why. And he said, you know, maybe she's pregnant, to which her doctor laughed. And he said, that's impossible. Her body in its weakened state would never be able to conceive. And if she could conceive, she'd never be able to keep the baby. But they decided to run a pregnancy test, and to his absolute amazement, she was pregnant. He said when he walked into the room to inform her that she kind of gave him a little bit of a sheepish smile and wink. He said to her, he said, I, I, I'm, I, I'm amazed that you're pregnant. He said, I need to let you know that you're not gonna be able, this baby is not going to survive and is actually going to make things worse for you. And back then, legally at that point, they could have offer her the option of an abortion, and he did. And she and her husband, for religious reasons, said, no, the baby stays. Well, weeks kept going by. She actually made it to February when her doctor noticed something strange. Her temperature, which was always hovering between 101 and 103, was actually now going down. Her appetite was returning, and she was able to keep the food down, it seemed like she was getting stronger and healthier. In fact, by March, they noticed that there had been a remarkable improvement in her body, and they tried to figure out why, and suddenly they realized that because her body was making room for that baby, it was doing naturally what, what a woman's body would do. It was pushing her diaphragm up and was pinching close that lower right lobe and stopping the tubercular cavity. Eventually, nine months later, her baby was born healthy and strong. And a few months after that, Eleanor went home from the hospital. Do you know what happened? That baby saved the mother's life. Let me read to you how he concludes this story that he shares. He says, I still find it hard to believe. And I've never heard of a comparable case since. I never discussed it with the young woman, even when she came in for checkups, which confirmed the full return of good health. And never until recently have I cited the case publicly to make a point. The child didn't destroy its mother. It saved her. Call it the will of God. Call it human love. Call it the mystic quality of motherhood. 
the turning in upon herself to fight still more because she had still another life to fight for. Call it what you will, it happened. It does not matter if it ever happens again. Indeed, it's not likely to ever happen again now that we have drugs to cure tuberculosis cases like hers, but that's not the point. It happened, and it happened, I'm convinced, because there is a force of nature, a wisdom, a balance, a mystery beyond man's comprehension, and man should recognize and accept it. If I needed any convincing, that woman convinced me. I still wonder at what she did and at the unfathomable forces it signifies. And I still remember with delight the Christmas cards she sent me for years. They were just ordinary cards with the usual printed greeting and her name, but for me, they are monuments to a miracle or the miracle of Christmas. Why did God cause his son through the Holy Spirit to be conceived in the womb of a young girl named Mary? It was in order that he might save her life and your life and my life by his presence. The Apostle Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 4 and said, But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law, so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Daddy. Father, now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Can I ask you a question? Do you know the presence of God in the womb of your soul? Have you felt and experienced his love, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness? Have you, have you experienced his, his purpose that he gives for you in this life? Have you experienced the hope of knowing that when you and I pass from this life, when you pass from this life, you will be with him in eternity, that you're going to receive a new body and be with the Lord forever? Some people call that a psychological crutch. They believe that all we have to live is this life, and that's it. If that's the case, then why is it that the faith is growing all around this world and not diminishing, as some people would say. Why is it with all our technical advances, all the materialism, all the things that we have available to us today, why is it people are still so empty? That's because inside of each one of us is a God-shaped vacuum that only God can fit. None of the other stuff fits. And God so wants to dwell in us and with us. That's what Emmanuel means, the with us God. I'd like you to just bow your heads with me for a moment. And I just want you to think about your life as a house with many rooms. I want to ask you this Christmas Eve, does the Lord Jesus have access to every room in your house? Some of us have a room where we keep all of our material things, all our successes, all our abilities, thinking that somehow it's up to us to make life work, to make life valuable, to have meaning, to have hope. Would you be willing to surrender that room to the Lord? Would you be willing to give him all those things, all that stuff, and say, God, I know that's not the meaning of life. It's blessings you've given me. I'm giving it back to you. You're my meaning of life. Some of you have a room where you keep bitterness and anger and resentment and hurts and bad feelings. And it's toxic. Would you be willing to empty that room and let Jesus have that room with his grace, his love, his forgiveness, and his mercy? Some of you have rooms where somehow you think that it's by your own efforts, your own abilities, all your good works, that somehow you'll earn a spot in heaven. And the Bible says that none of us can. All of us are sinners and fall short to the glory of God. Would you give that room up to him and, trop, and stop trying to earn your way into heaven, so to speak? Is your house totally available 
Is the womb of your life completely available to the presence of Christ? Right now, where you are, would you be willing to surrender your whole self to him? You know, sometimes we keep our houses so clean and so neat, and then because of life and challenges that happen, they get cluttered, right? Spring will come, and we have what we call spring cleaning, get things back in order and organized. You know, there are some of us who are followers of Christ. We've made a decision years ago or recently to follow Christ, but we've allowed it to become cluttered by all kinds of stuff. Maybe what you need to do is declutter right now. Renew your surrender to him. Let me be still for just a few moments. Why don't you just say, Lord, here's my life. Here's my body. Tell him, Lord, I surrender to you my mind, my thinking, my imagination. Lord, I surrender to you my will, my choices. Lord, I surrender to you my emotions, my feelings. Lord, I surrender to you my very body, my resources, my relationships, my concerns, my worries, my fears. Fill me, Lord, with your presence and help me to live out of that presence as I begin this new year. Lord, I pray, help us all, myself included, this Christmas Eve, to surrender our entire being to your presence, your saving presence in our lives. That's why you came. And I just thank you, Lord, that as Mary had you in her physical womb, we can have you in our soul, living in us. And your presence in us is what saves us. And we're so thankful for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Merry Christmas.